Our next presentation is by uh, Gerald Martin. Uh, Gerald Martin returned to Hawaii a couple of years ago. He's been uh, out here uh, working um, for some time with the East West Centre and has uh, recently returned. His uh, work uh, on mosquitoes and um, copepods uh, you'll be hearing about later on uh, in the uh, program. But today um, he's going to talk about eco-tipping points. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Gerald Martin. Thanks. The problem with environmental problems is they're so overwhelmingly complex, so overwhelming in scale, and driven by environmentally powerful social and ecological forces. Often it seems we're swimming, swimming helplessly against the current when we try to make a positive change. Today I want to tell you about an approach to the problem which makes the complexity more manageable while pointing to what we can do to make things better. Over the years, as a systems ecologist focusing on human ecology, I've seen and heard about situations that have been turned around from disaster or potential disaster and put on a track to sustainability. I wondered what factors are at play in these situations and in recent years set about investigating this. My goal now is to disseminate what I found to be useful so people can be more effective at creating solutions for their communities. Several years ago, I teamed up with two journalists to look for lessons in environmental success stories. We collected about 100 stories from around the world and made site visits document several dozen of the stories. We went to India, Southeast Asia, and around the United States. We found that the scripts of the stories had a lot in common. In every story, biodiversity, ecosystem integrity, and ecosystem health went hand in hand with human well-being. And in every story, the sweeping changes from environmental, to de environmental decline to restoration could be traced back to a lever a lever that set the change in motion. I call this lever an eco-tipping point. I'll tell you one of the stories to show, what, to show you what I mean. The coastal fishery in the Philippines, one of the world's largest, is in big trouble. The trouble started back in the 60s with the introduction of destructing fish, destructive fishing methods such as dynamite and cyanide, very effective for catching fish, but not a good idea for the long haul. The fishery descended into a vicious cycle of damaging the coral reef habitat, declining fish stocks, and the need to do even more destructive fishing to catch anything at all. The government reacted with laws against destructive fishing, but they weren't effective. Today the fish stocks are only a few percent of what they were 50 years ago, and in some places a fisherman may catch zero, one, or two fish in a day. Twenty-five years ago, this was well on the way to happening at Apo Island, but it did not happen there. The island's fishing grounds are coral reef habitat ex extending 500 meters from shore like a donut surrounding the island. The fishermen back then were paddling long distances from the island, dawn to dusk, searching for places that still had some fish, and fishing destructively to get all they could. You can, you can see uh, in this diagram the, <coughs> the two interconnected uh, <coughs> vicious cycles. One, one is, the, is the, the one that I, I just showed you of the destructive fishing and uh, degradation of uh, habitat and uh, decline of the fishery. And the other one is the, is the one of people fishing, of the fishermen fishing further and further away from the island, uh, and fishing in places where they really didn't care about the future, didn't care about the stewardship of the fishery. A marine scientist at nearby Silliman University spent two years talking with Apple's fishermen about what was happening and what they might do about it. In 1982, they decided to set off 450 meters of the island shoreline, about 10% of the fishing grounds around the island, as a no fishing zone a marine sanctuary. The islanders weren't sure it would improve their catches. There was no kapu tradition there. 
They had no experience with this sort of thing. They played it safe by picking an area where the fish were badly depleted already, and there wasn't much to lose by not fishing there. This is, this is their uh, marine sanctuary. Three years later, the sanctuary had an amazing number of fish, and there was improvement in catches close to the sanctuary. But most important, the fishermen was so, were so inspired by what happened inside the sanctuary, they decided to do something about the rest of their island's fishing grounds. They made and enforced two rules. Only Apple Island fishermen could fish there, and no destructive fishing. There was noticeable improvement within a few years, though it took about 10 years for stocks of the, of the large fish to recover fully. And now the fishermen are back to fishing right around the island. A few hours of fishing each day gets them all the fish they need. Now you can see, you can see in, the, in the diagram here that the two vicious cycles were reversed to form virtuous cycles, allowing the fishermen to do more and more of their fishing at home as the fish stocks improve there bit by bit. And it was also reinforced by an additional cycle, which you can see at the top of the diagram, which uh, a new virtuous cycle of pride, commitment, and success breeds success. The restoration of Apo's coral reef ecosystem had set in motion a cascade of spin-offs that created new cycles, reinforcing the, the switch into sustainability. Reef tourism has brought in cash to the local government and many families on the island. And there are two small hotels and a, and a, dive, and a dive, shot, di dive shop there, and uh, ladies selling t-shirts. When I was there, I bought 10 of them, all different. And The island community now has the ecological savvy to make sure tourists don't damage their coral ecosystems. And even more significantly, they've used some of the money to improve their primary school, including a marine ecology curriculum. Now most of their children go to high school, and many make it to university. And a lot of it is because, because of that money and, and the, the ecological consciousness and community consciousness. I met a graduate student studying marine resource management and strong, strongly committed to a sustaining the integrity, integrity of the island's marine ecosystem. Apple's also started a family planning program to ensure that the island's future population doesn't exceed the carrying capacity of their fishing grounds. Everybody's into it. Ask the kids how many children they want, and they all say, two. They're programmed. <laughs> Visit Visitors from other fishing villages throughout the Philippines have come to Apo to see what's happening, and 400 villages now have marine sanctuaries. Everyone on the island believes the sanctuary is sacred, and their marine ecosystem, too. They say that the sanctuary saved their fishery, their marine ecosystem, and their way of life. But in fact, the sanctuary was only the lever that got it started. It was an eco-tipping point. And here you can see some of the kids on Apple Island tipping their way to a resilient future. Another story. This time from India. This story is about pesticide dependence, but it could be dependence on fossil fuels or many other things. Fifteen years ago, poor cotton farmers in Andhra Pradesh were caught in a downward spiral of pesticide resistance, increasingly heavier pesticide applications, loss of beneficial insects and birds that preyed on cotton pests, chronic and acute pesticide poisoning, and mounting debt due to pesticide expenses, re resulting in despair and the highest suicide rate in India. The, meth the method of choice for suicide being a pesticide cocktail. The, they were trapped. They couldn't stop using the pesticides because natural controls were gone. The crops were a wipeout without pesticides. They couldn't stop growing cotton because of debts to the middlemen who sold them the pesticides, bought their crops and extended them credit, and who, of course, demanded full 
payment of all debts if farmers were no longer their customers. Like other villages in the region, Punakula Village was already rock bottom when a worker from a local NGO began talking to the farmers there about non-pesticide management, NPM. NPM is built around neem, which is a, <coughs> a, a, the seeds and leaves of this common tree are ground into powder, soaked overnight in water, and sprayed onto the crop. The pest insects die of starvation, and beneficial insects remain unharmed because eem, eem, neem does not actually kill the insects outright. It acts more, more as a repellent, keeping them from feeding on the, on the cotton. And, it's, and neem has the advantage that it's not a single chemical. It's a, it's, it's a multitude of, of, of protective chemicals that this, this tree has for protecting its own self from, in, from insects. There was more in the NPM kit. If you look at this list here, I like the, the, uh, the virus. Uh, infected bollworm larvae are gathered from the fields. They, they, they're hanging down from the cotton. They, they, they've died. They can, they're easy to spot. And they're ground into a solution, which is sprayed onto the crop. It's, it's their own biodiversity resource. No need to buy it from a high-tech multinational corporation. I was also impressed with the small bonfires to attract bollworm moss to their doom on moonless nights. One desperate farmer courageously decided to try NPM. That was the eco-tipping point. His cotton crop with NPM had some pest damage, like everyone else, but he made a nice profit because he didn't pay a rupee for pesticides. Within two years, everyone in the village was using NPM, and they began to climb out of debt. The middlemen retaliated by paying a lower price for NPM cotton, but the farmers formed a co-op and found other buyers. <clears throat> And you can see in this diagram how the vicious cycles were reversed, and <clears throat> particularly the birds and beneficial insects came back, so did natural control, the cotton pests, and now they don't even have to use much of the neem. Their success with NPM gave the Punakula villagers confidence to take on more challenges. They switched from chemical fertilizer to vermicompost, reducing their input costs further. Some of the women started a business selling neem powder to other villages, and they took on other challenges to improve the village. People from other villages came to see what was happening, and with assistance from local NGOs, several hundred villages now use NPM. And I should say that talking to people there, they were so enthusiastic telling me how they had escaped from hell. The multinational pesticide companies lobby the government to suppress NPM, but instead the government added NPM to its agricultural extension program. These villages are very different from here. I had, I had two more short stories, both in the United States. I'll, I'll, go, over them, uh, I'll go over them quickly. Uh, one, one is about uh, New York City where uh, the Bowery was, in the 70s, was in, was in a downward spiral with, with run-down, abandoned buildings, uh, perilous streets, general neglect, and it was, you can, you can sketch out this, these vicious cycles of, uh, <coughs> of urban decay, uh, people moving, moving away, and of uh, <coughs> less and less investment maintenance and services going in, into the area. The, uh, then, in 1973, they made a, uh, uh, in one vacant lot, they made a community garden. They had to clear away 10 feet high trash from the whole thing to do it. And uh, now there are 800 gardens in New York City. Uh, <coughs> And you, you can see here that the, the vicious cycles of urban decay got turned around uh, to restoration because the gardens tied into to, uh, <coughs> that, those vicious cycles in numerous ways uh, in, the w in the way of improving the quality of the neighborhood, uh, community solidarity, and so on and so on, and an additional new, uh, uh, new cycle of uh, awareness and pride and so on. The, 
I'll skip over the story I was going to tell from Arcata, California, uh, but it, it's a story. It's a story where uh, <coughs> they were ordered by the state to buy into a very large, expensive sewage processing system in that region. And for numerous reasons, they didn't want to do it. It was going to quadruple their, their uh, sewage rates. Uh, it was going to contribute to urban sprawl filling in between the towns and the area and so on. And so instead, they made a, uh, a wetland uh, completely from scratch from uh, some derelict, this is right on the coast, uh, derelict uh, sawmill ponds and the city dump. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, coastal wetland is an endangered ecosystem in California. And it took uh, uh, more than 10 years to fill itself out completely. But now it's not only a, a uh, uh, purifying, it's purifying their sewage water, higher quality, much higher quality than is required. Uh, a uh, recreational area of pride for the city and drawing several hundred thousand tourists a year to see all the, uh, the wildfowl. What do we make of these stories? There, there were unsuccessful attempts to deal with a problem, swimming against the current, but a lever was found and acted upon. What were the levers? In every case, in ecotechnology, in the very broadest sense of the word, uh, combined with the social organization to put it into practice, often an arduous process. Not just any ecotechnology will do. What makes it right for a particular situation? First of all, ecotipping points are catalytic. They set in motion a cascade of changes. But it takes more than that. And here we come to the crux of the matter. It's all about feedback loops. If environmental decline is driven by vicious cycles, the decline will be turned around only if the vicious cycles are themselves turned around. This may not be easy. The cycles may be very powerful. But it's the only way to switch to a course of restoration under these circumstances. Here's the good news. Once the vicious cycles are turned around, the very same feedback loops can work just as powerfully to bring about restoration and health. And they spin off new virtuous cycles of success for each success that accelerate the process and lock in the gains. Through all of this, nature's doing a substantial amount of the work, and normal social and economic processes are doing a lot too. The application of eco-tipping points is a work in process. They're not magic bullets. Turning en environmental problems around takes a lot of work, no matter how it's done. Nonetheless, an eco-tipping point perspective should be able to help. We know that we can map out the vicious and virtuous cycles and success stories by, si by hindsight. How about foresight? How can we identify or create eco-tipping points where success stories are not yet underway? The first step is analytical, diagramming the vicious cycles that are driving the, the decline. Then comes the creative step, devising what can tie into the vicious cycles in a way that gives them a hard enough kick to turn around. The more ways an eco-tipping point ties into the vicious cycles, the better. Inspiration can often come from existing success stories. Now, I've only had time to give you a glimpse of the eco-tipping point paradigm, but you can go to the project website, ecotippingpoints.org, for more about the stories I told you, as well as many additional stories and further explanation about how eco-tipping eco points work and what it take, takes to create them. A lot remains to be worked out for eco-tipping points to be used on a routine basis. For example, we're working on a typology so eco-tipping points don't have to be reinvented every time. We're also starting to work with communities to map out the vicious cycles that are driving their problems and explore what can be done to give the vicious cycles a kick in reverse. If you know of any communities that would be interested in doing this, or if you yourself would like to give it a try, please let me know. I'm also looking for eco-tipping point success stories in Hawaii. You can contact me at the email address on the screen or through the website. Thank you for your attention.